Chapter One of the Spider by Fergus Hume. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One A Possible Partnership. The exterior of the Athenian Club, Pall Mall, represents an ordinary twentieth century mansion, which it is but within the name is justified by a greco-roman architecture of vast spaces marble floors painted ceilings and pillared walls adapted more or less successfully to the chilly british climate the various rooms are called by latin names and the use of these is rigidly enforced standing outside the mansion you know that you are in london enter and you behold athens say the abode of alcibiades listen and scraps of speech suggest imperial rome thus the tastes of all the members whether old and pedantic or young and frivolous are consulted and gratified modern slang as well as the stately tongue of virgil is heard in the athenian for the club like st paul is all things to all men for that reason it is a commercial success strangers they come eagerly with members to behold rumoured glories enter the clubhouse through imitation bronze gates into the vestibulum and pass through an inner door into the atrium this means that they leave the entrance room for the general conversation apartment to the right of this looking from the doorway is the tablinum which answers perhaps not very correctly as regards the name the purposes of a library to the left a lordly portal gives admittance into the triclinium that is to the dining-room at the end of the atrium which is the neutral ground of the club where members and strangers meet swing doors shut in the pinacoteca properly this should be a picture gallery but in deference to modern requirements it is used as a smoking-room these three rooms spacious ornate and lofty open under a colonnade or peristyle on to a glass-roofed winter garden which runs like a narrow passage round the three sides of the building the viridarium as the members call this cultivated strip of land extends only twenty feet from the marble pavement of the peristyle and is bounded by the side walls and rear walls of adjacent houses it is filled with palms and tropical plants with foreign and native flowers and owing to a skilful concealment of its limitations by the use of enormous mirrors festooned with creepers and ivy it really resembles vast pleasure gardens extending to great distances the outlook from the tablinum the pinacoteca and the triclinium is a triumph of perspective below the state apartments on the ground floor are the kitchens the domestic offices and the servants rooms above them the cubicles are to be found where members both resident or non-resident sleep when disposed on beds more comfortable than classical finally on the top floor and reached by a lift are billiard rooms card rooms and a small gymnasium for those who require exercise the whole scheme is modelled on a larger scale from the house of glaucus as described by bulwer lytton in the last days of pompeii a perusal of this famous story suggested the novelty to an enterprising builder and the athenian club is the successful result the members of such a club should have been classical scholars but these were the minority the greater portion of those who patronized this latest london freak were extremely up-to-date and defended their insistent modernity amidst ancient artificial environment by acts seventeen twenty one for the athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing and certainly they acted well up to the text for all the scandal and novelty of the metropolis seemed to flow from this pseudo-classical source plays were discussed in manuscript novels on the eve of publication inventors came here to suggest plans for airships or to explain how the earth could signal to mars some members had brand new ideas for the improvement of motor mechanism 
others desired to evolve colour from sound detailing with many words how music could be made visible as to politics the athenians knew everything which was going on behind the scenes and could foretell equally truthfully a war a change of government the abdication of a monarch or the revolt of an oppressed people if any traveller arrived from the land at the back of beyond with an account of a newly discovered island or an entirely new animal he was sure to be a member of the club thus although the interior of the pall mall mansion suggested greece and rome nero and pericles the appointments for comfort for the quick dispatch of business or pleasure and the ideas conversation and dress of the members were if anything six months ahead of the present year of grace the athenian club was really a mixture or blending of two far apart epochs the very ancient and the very modern but the dark ages were left out as the members had no use for medieval ignorance over the mosaic dog with his warning lettering cave canem strolled one warm evening in june a young man of twenty-four whose physical appearance was more in keeping with the classical surroundings than were his faultlessly fitting dress clothes his oval clean-shaven face was that of a pure-blooded helene his curly golden hair and large blue eyes like the sky of italy at noon suggested the sun-god and his figure limber active and slender resembled the hermes of the palestra he was almost aggressively handsome and apparently knew that he was for he swaggered in with a haughty lord of the world there entirely confident of himself and of his capabilities his exuberant vitality was as pronounced as were his good looks and there was a finish about his toilette which hinted at a determination to make the most of his appearance he assuredly succeeded in accentuating what nature had done for him since even the attendant who approached to remove the young man's light overcoat appeared to be struck by this splendid vision of perfect health perfect beauty and perfect lordship of existence all the fairies must have come to the cradle of this fortunate young gentleman with profuse gifts he seemed to be the embodiment of joyous life is mr arthur vernon here he asked settling his waistcoat touching the flower on his buttonhole and pulling a handkerchief out of his left sleeve in the pinacoteca sir was the reply for all the attendants were carefully instructed in correct pronunciation shall i tell him you are here mr maunders the gentleman thus named yawned lazily thanks i shall see him myself and with a nod to the man he walked lightly through the atrium looking like one of flaxman's creations only he was more clothed throwing keen glances right and left to see who was present and who was not mr maunders entered the pinacoteca this was an oblong apartment with marble walls on three sides and a lordly range of pillars on the fourth which was entirely open to the gardens beyond could be seen the luxuriant vegetation of the undergrowth whence sprang tall palms duplicated in the background of mirrors the mosaic pavement of the smoking-room was strewn with persian praying mats whose vivid colouring matched the pictured floor there were deep armchairs and softly cushioned sofas all upholstered in dark red leather which contrasted pleasantly with the snowy walls many small tables of white metal and classical shapes were dotted here there and everywhere as it was mid-june and extremely close the fireplace looking somewhat incongruous in such a place was filled with ferns and white flowers in red pots of earthenware thus repeating the general scheme of colour red and white snow and fire with a spread of green in the viridarium nothing could have been more artistic under the peristyle and near a fountain whence water sprang from the conch of a triton to fall into a shallow marble basin with prismatic hues were several copper-topped tables near them basket chairs draped with brightly hued rugs were scattered in picturesque disorder one of them was occupied by a long slim man of thirty with a cigarette between his lips and a cup of coffee at his elbow he stared straight in front of him and looked up swiftly when he heard maunder's springy steps 
here you are at last he remarked somewhat coolly and glanced at his watch why didn't you turn up to dinner as arranged it's close on nine o'clock couldn't get away from my aunt replied maunders slipping leisurely into an adjacent chair she seemed to have the blues about something and wouldn't let me go never was there so affectionate an aunt as mrs bedge and never one so tryingly attentive considering that she has brought you up in the past supplies you with money at present and intends to make you her heir in the future you might talk more kindly of her maunders shrugged his shoulders oh the eton oxford education was all right she did well by me there but i don't get much money from her now and judging from that i may be heir to very little you ought to be glad that you are an heir to anything said vernon frowning for his friend's light tones jarred why asked the other my parents are dead long since aunt emily is my only relative and has neither chick nor child if she didn't intend to leave me her money she should not have brought me up to luxury and idleness it could certainly be better if she had made you work assented the host contemptuously but you were always lazy and extravagant i was born sitting down i am a lily of the field and a rose of sharon likewise an ass you think so said maunders dryly well i hope to change your opinion on that point before we part it will take a deal of changing but all this talk is beside the purpose of our meeting you've made this appointment with me and didn't keep it to the minute i'm nearly two hours late well what does it matter everything to me i am a busy man snapped the other sharply so you say maunders looked very directly at his host some fellows don't think so your business vernon interrupted i have no business i am an independent man and yet a busy one rejoined maunders softly strange there was the significance in his tone which made vernon colour although he remained motionless he certainly was about to make a hasty observation but his guest looked at him so straightly and smilingly that he bit his lip and refrained from immediate speech maunders still smiling took a cigarette from a golden case and lighted up you might offer me a cup of coffee vernon signalled to a passing attendant a cup of coffee for mr maunders with vanilla bean directed the other man i don't like coffee otherwise and hurry up please then when the servant departed he turned suavely to his host i forget what we were talking about so do i retorted vernon coolly maunders smoking delicately rested his wrists on the copper edge of the table and looked searchingly into his friend's strong face and vernon's face was strong much stronger than that of his companion he likewise had blue eyes but of a deep sea blue less shallow and more piercing than those of maunders his face was also oval with finely cut features but more scored with thought marks and his hair was as dark smooth and short cropped as that of the others was golden curly and odd adjective to use in conjunction with a man fluffy both were clean-shaven but vernon's mouth was firm while the lips of maunders were less compressed and betrayed indecision the former had the more athletic figure the latter a more graceful one and although both were well groomed and well dressed vernon was less of the dandy in his attention to detail poetically speaking one man was night and the other day but a keen observer would have read that the first used strength of body and brain to achieve his ends while the last relied more on cunning and from the looks of the twain cunning and strength were about to try conclusions yet they had been child friends school friends and so far as their paths ran parallel were life friends with certain reservations you were always as deep as a well arty said maunders finally removing his eyes from the other's face and turning to take his cup of coffee don't call me arty snapped vernon irritably you were arty at eton when we were boys tall and short we are not at eton now i always think that there is something weak in a man being called by his christian name outside his family much less being ticketed with a confounded diminutive 
you can call me connie if you like as you used to i shan't or even constantine maunders is good enough for me oh is he the fair man glanced shrewdly over the coffee cup he was holding to his lips you hold to that i hold to the name not to the individual said vernon curtly you don't trust me i don't i see no reason to trust you ah oh, you will when i explain why i asked you to meet me here said maunders in his frivolous manner i dare say go on his friend sighed what a laconic beast you are arty my name is vernon if you please always vernon asked maunders in silky tones the other man sat up alertly what do you mean i mean that i want you to take me into partnership partnership vernon's face grew an angry red what the devil do you know softly softly i know many things although there is no need to swear it's bad form vernon deuced bad form the fact is he went on gracefully my aunt keeps me short of money and i want all i can get to enjoy life i thought as i am pretty good in finding out things about people that you might invite me to become a partner in your detective business vernon cast a hasty glance around fortunately there were no guests under the peristyle and only two men out of earshot in the pinacoteca you are talking rubbish he said roughly yet apprehensively i don't think so your father died three years ago and left you with next to nothing having no profession you did not know what to do and ashamed to beg borrow or steal you turned your powers of observation to account on the side of the law against the criminal maunders took a card from his waistcoat pocket and passed it along nemo private inquiry agent twenty two fenella street covent garden is inscribed on that card nemo means nobody i believe yet nemo as i know means arthur vernon of the athenian club the man addressed tore the card to pieces and threw them amongst the flowers you talk rubbish he said again and still roughly how do you connect me with this private enquiry agent ah that's too long a story to tell you just now maunders glanced at his watch i am due at a ball in an hour and want the matter settled before i leave here what matter the partnership matter there was a pause well i have nothing to say said vernon firmly maunders rose in that case i'll cut along and go earlier than i expected to lady corsoon's ball lady corsoon vernon changed colour and bit his lip yes she didn't ask you to her ball did she she wouldn't of course seeing that you were in love with her daughter lucy that young lady used to marry money and you haven't any but what you make out of your detective business perhaps if i tell her that you are doing well as nemo she might by this time vernon was on his feet don't you dare don't you dare he panted hoarsely and the perspiration beaded his brow oh maunders raised his eyebrows then it is true after all sit down commanded vernon savagely resuming his own seat we must talk this matter out if you please i came here for that purpose only don't keep me too late i am engaged to lucy for the third waltz and must not disappoint her vernon winced you have no right to call miss corson by her christian name why not she's not engaged to you i love her and as yet as yet mind you vernon i have as good a right as you to cut in i understood that you were as good as engaged to miss dimsdale oh maunders lightly flipped away a cigarette ash the shoe's on the other foot there she loves me but i don't love her still there's money in the business if ida becomes mrs maunders old dimsdale's got no end of cash and ida inherits everything as his only child but he wants her to marry colonel towton you know the chap who did so well in some hill tribe extermination in india but ida loves me and towton's got no chance unless i marry lucy corsoon and give him a hook in you're a cynical conceited feather-headed young ass said vernon with cold self-restrained fury and i forbid you to speak of miss corsoon in that commercial way 
much less call her by her christian name she loves me and i love her and we intend to marry if if lady corsoon permits the match finished maunders stretching out his long legs it's no go my dear fellow she doesn't think you rich enough for the girl i never heard that constantine maunders was a millionaire retorted the other man bitterly my face is my fortune old chap and there are various ways of getting lady corsoon's consent what ways asked vernon suddenly and searchingly looking at his friend ah you ask too much i am not your partner yet that means you have some knowledge about lady corsoon which you can use to force her to consent perhaps i know a great deal about most people every one has his or her secrets as well as her or his price are you a private inquiry agent also sneered vernon leaning back ah maunders seized upon the half admission then you are nemo yes assented the dark man reluctantly although i can't guess how you came to know about my business i wished the fact kept dark as it would be disastrous for me in society probably admitted maunders lazily one doesn't like to hobnob with an asmodeus who goes in for unroofing houses yet you propose to join asmodeus chafed vernon uneasily oh yes i think it's a paying business you see and i want money how i learned about the matter is of no great consequence and i don't think any one else will connect you with this nemo abstraction and when in partnership i shall of course keep it dark for my own sake i dare say sneered vernon secretly furious at having to submit and on what terms do you propose to join in the business you despise half profits said maunders promptly really you seem to set some value on yourself no one else will if i don't replied maunders good-humouredly see here arty oh then vernon if you will your business as a private inquiry agent is to find out things about people and i beg your pardon but you talk through your hat interrupted vernon acidly my business is to assist people to settle business which the general public is not supposed to know i don't find out people's business they come to me with difficult cases and i settle them to the best of my ability yes yes said maunders leniently you put the best complexion on it old man but it's dirty work all the same it is nothing of the sort almost shouted vernon then sank his voice to a furious whisper my business is perfectly honest and clean the nature of it requires secrecy but i take up nothing the doing of which would reflect on my honour i have precious little money and also a logical way of looking at things for that reason i trade as nemo under the rose of course laughed maunders you don't put your goods in the shop window however i understand perfectly and i am willing to come in with you oh make no mistake my dear chap i am worth having as a partner as i know heaps about tom dick and harry which they would rather were kept out of the newspapers i don't run a blackmailing business said vernon passionately what a nasty word and wholly unnecessary i never suggested blackmailing any one that i know of all i say is that having a goodish acquaintance with the seamy side of society life i can earn my half of the nemo profits by assisting you and if i refuse i shall hint mind you i shan't say anything straight out but i shall hint that you are a professionally inquisitive person i don't know if you are aware of it said vernon slowly but you are a scoundrel oh dear me no not at all rejoined the other airily i am simply a young man with the tastes of a duke and the income of a pauper naturally i wish to supplement that income and your secret business seems to offer advantages in the way of earning immediate cash and if i don't consent you will do your best to ruin me socially that's business said maunders promptly get a man into a corner and skin him at your leisure well do you consent i can't do anything else that i can see said the other bitterly however you must give me a week to come to a decision take a month answered the visitor generously i'm not in a hurry to skin you old man you can't get out of the corner you know 
and see here if we make a fortune out of this business i'll give you a chance with lucy and take ida dimsdale with her ten thousand a year will she have that much oh certainly i made inquiries said maunders coolly it's no use jumping in the dark you know old dimsdale his christian name's martin was a police commissioner in burma some years ago and shook the pagoda tree to some purpose now he's retired and lives in a gorgeously glorified bungalow which he built at hampstead he's not a bad chap and ida is uncommonly good-looking i might do worse what about colonel towton i'll cut him out he's a very young colonel of forty-five handsome and smart but with precious little brain about him he's got an ancient country house in yorkshire and but here i'll be taking all night maunders jumped up and lucy is waiting for me you can take a month thank you said vernon frigidly i shall give you my answer then it will be yes of course you can't say anything else i say maunders threw a laughing glance over his shoulders by this time you must have changed your opinion as to my being an ass and he departed still laughing vernon ran after him and touched his shoulder not an ass but a scoundrel he breathed with suppressed passion and maunders laughter increased end of chapter one read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter two of the spider by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter two a confidential communication when maunders passed into the atrium vernon returned slowly to his seat under the peristyle here he ordered a fresh cup of strong coffee to clear his brain lighted another cigarette and sat down to recall the late conversation as a preliminary to a thorough consideration of the situation he ran over in his mind what he knew of the man who wished to become his partner his memory showed maunders to be an exceedingly unscrupulous person who was ready to do anything to gratify his appetite for pleasure vernon's recollections carried him back to a berkshire village of which his father had been the squire mrs bedge the widow of a levantine merchant had taken a house in the neighbourhood and there had settled with her nephew constantine maunders it seemed that her sister had married a naturalized greek hence the boy's christian name as the parents were dead mrs bedge being without offspring had adopted the orphan but from what vernon remembered maunders had always been a handsome and charming little boy who usually got his own way by sheer amiability and good looks but he had inherited more from his greek father than a classical face and a christian name which smacked of old constantinople for he was crafty and clever and utterly without moral principle he could conceal his feelings admirably he could scheme for his wants very dexterously and he told a lie or the truth with the utmost impartiality when either suited the end to be gained posing as an innocent angel child he deceived every one and although outwardly he appeared to be an unsophisticated babe he was in reality a little monster of egotism even when they were children together vernon from bitter experience had always mistrusted constantine and had judged his character more accurately than grown-up people those were invariably taken in by the brat's cherubic aspect at eton constantine fared less happily he was ten years of age when his aunt sent him there and as vernon then was fifteen she had asked him to look after her darling but all vernon's chivalry could not save constantine from well-deserved kicks and thrashings schoolboys are not to be taken in by angel children so constantine did not have a happy time however he was so diplomatic and so unscrupulous that he managed to scramble through school life fairly well at oxford whither he went some years after vernon he got on better and became a general favourite because of his general pliancy of disposition by means of that same pliancy he usually secured his selfish ends under a guise of consistent amiability 
being quick-brained and clever if somewhat shallow he secured his degree and left the university with an excellent character but since then he had been a man about town supported by his aunt's money mrs bedge had settled in london at constantine's request and could refuse him nothing yet as vernon judged from what the young man had said even mrs bedge's generosity could not supply maunders with sufficient money to gratify the selfish desire he had always had for pleasure only the income of a rothschild could have entirely satisfied his cravings for the delights of existence vernon had been less lucky in life his father had speculated rashly and three years prior to the meeting of the young men at the athenian club had died a comparative pauper thrown on his own resources and without a profession vernon had utilized his observant and logical faculties to set up in private practice as a detective for two years he had carried on the trade with success and without having been found out but now that constantine had come on the scene vernon felt that there would be trouble of course by taking him as a partner an exposure could be avoided but only temporarily maunders was so ready to make mischief that vernon felt he would take all he could get out of the business and when prosperous by marriage with ida dimsdale would not hesitate to tell the truth the sole safeguard lay in the fact that being tarred with the same brush maunders for his own social sake might hold his tongue he was always clever enough to avoid the publication of any facts to his disadvantage it really seemed on these grounds that it would be judicious to admit him as a partner but vernon shivered at the prospect at the best such a business as he was engaged in was a delicate one and decidedly unpopular with maunders unscrupulous methods it might degenerate into a series of shady transactions but i'll take the month and think it over thought vernon when he had finished his coffee and cigarette much may happen in thirty days which may enable me to get out of the difficulty then he took out his watch and noted that it was ten o'clock just time to see dimsdale he yawned when putting on his light overcoat in the vestibulum vernon thought it was a strange coincidence that maunders should have mentioned incidentally of course the name of the man with whom he had an appointment at half-past ten o'clock earlier in the day vernon had received a pressing note asking him to meet the writer at colonel towton's chambers ralph street st james at that hour so as a matter of fact two names pertinent to the situation had been mentioned dimsdale and towton vernon wondered as he walked along pall mall what the reason could be he did not believe in coincidence and had sufficient experience of life to doubt the existence of chance so the mention of the names taken in conjunction with the appointment must point to some problem being worked out vernon believed as every thoughtful man must believe that everything was worked out in the unseen world before it became a factor in the visible plane and he was quite prepared to find on this assumption that the meeting with dimsdale in towton's chambers was more important than it appeared to be on the surface subsequent events proved that he was right in his conjecture meanwhile as he was a one thing at a time man he sauntered leisurely along towards his destination wondering what dimsdale wished to see him about the ex-police commissioner was one of the very few people who knew of the business in covent garden dimsdale had been a lifelong friend of vernon's father and had welcomed the young man with open arms to his home it was odd that vernon had not fallen in love with ida as nothing would have pleased dimsdale better than to have given his daughter and her money to his old friend's son but fortune in her freakish way had decided that vernon should fall in love with lucy corson where every obstacle would be placed in the way of a successful wooing so ida and arthur had settled contentedly down into a brother and sister relationship dimsdale was annoyed that his pet project of marriage could not come to pass but there was no help for it as he could not govern the young man's affections also he was annoyed because vernon when the death of his father occurred would not let the elder man assist him however he told him his plans about the private inquiry office and although the ex-police commissioner did not wholly approve 
he judged from his knowledge of the young man's detective powers that it was the best use he could put his talents to more than this he managed to bring him clients and to spread the fame of nemo by dexterous illusions vernon therefore was doing very well in the line he had struck out for himself and felt duly grateful to dimsdale for his assistance he thought as he walked along ralph street that probably the old gentleman had found him a fresh client but it was odd that colonel towton's chambers should have been chosen as the meeting-place since dimsdale belonged to several clubs and the matter whatever it was must be very important else dimsdale would have waited until vernon paid his weekly visit to the hampstead bungalow it was only a quarter past ten o'clock when vernon arrived and he thought that he would have to wait but towton's servant intimated that mr dimsdale was watching for his visitor in the colonel's particular sanctum and ushered the young man into the room the colonel himself did not appear to be present but martin dimsdale was smoking in a deep armchair and jumped up in his boyish way to shake hands warmly he always had a great regard for arthur vernon the room was an ordinary apartment comfortably furnished but in a strictly bachelor fashion the scheme of colour was deep green and deep red so that it appeared somewhat sombre trophies of towton's sporting instincts in the shape of skins and heads appeared on the walls and on the floor there were many military portraits and groups about reminiscent of the colonel's army life the two windows were open and the curtains were pulled back so that the room was fairly cool while on the table stood a siphon some glasses and a decanter of whisky together with a box of cigars these were at mr dimsdale's elbow he had evidently been passing the time in smoking and drinking pending his young friend's arrival i'm glad to see you boy said the ex-police commissioner pointing to a chair sit down and make yourself at home towton gives me full permission to play in this yard have a peg and a cigar not too strong please warned vernon accepting a cigar and sinking into the indicated chair i haven't so steady a head as yours it's a cleverer head said dimsdale squirting in the potash else i should not have asked you to meet me here nemo oh vernon placed the glass beside him i thought it was a case but why did you ask me to meet you in towton's rooms where is towton at my sister's ball along with ida and miss hest lady corson's ball dimsdale sat down and nodded yes it's a swell affair as sir julius wants to make an impression on some australian people he desires to rope into his schemes for making money something to do with mines i believe i didn't feel inclined to go although i dare say i'll have to look in later to fetch ida and miss hest home i wished particularly to see you his manner assumed a portentous gravity so i asked towton if i could come here and make the appointment but at your club what i have to say is sacred and secret interrupted the old gentleman a club has many eyes and ears better be on the safe side oh that's all right he added with a nod on seeing vernon's eyes stray to the open window those only look out over the roofs of houses no one can hear us whisky all right cigar drawing well very good now then he settled himself for an exhaustive talk the old indian officer had certainly not been dried up by the hot climate where he had spent the greater part of his life he was a round tubby rosy-faced little man all curves and gracious contentment his face was clean-shaven and his head was bald while his sharp gray eyes twinkled behind the gold-rimmed pince-nez balanced on an unimportant nose with his round head and round body sphere superimposed upon sphere and short legs he looked like the figure of a chinese mandarin and nodded his head like one when he wished to emphasize a point there was nothing military about him in any way and vernon wondered how so natty and neat an old gentleman ever came to have command of men appointed to hunt down dacquats in the jungles of burma yet dimsdale's official career had been a stirring one and he had done good service in pacifying the country after the war now he had beaten his sword into a ploughshare and with a considerable fortune was spending his amiable old age under his own fig-tree 
when vernon looked at the rotund little man with the round rosy face he saw before him a perfectly contented human being and a very kind-hearted one to boot well sir he said leaning back comfortably we're tiled in as masons say so i shall be glad to hear what you have to tell me also i am obliged to you for seeking out this especial case for me two special cases my boy two special cases said mr dimsdale wagging his head and looking more like a chinese mandarin than ever one has to do with me i'll tell you about it later the other has to do with mrs bedge and her adopted son maunders cried vernon astonished to find that his premonition was coming true you don't mean constantine yes i do arthur of course i do young maunders i never did like that boy somehow in spite of his good looks and polite manners after all he's half a greek and i don't like the greeks either they're nearly as tricky as the armenians and that's saying a lot all the same i'm sorry for the sake of emily i'm an old friend of emily ha ha i was in love with her before she married Bedge. he was a levantine merchant you know dealt in currants and cherry jam and all the rest of it not a bad chap from what i remember of him but far too old a husband for emily do you mean mrs Bedge? asked vernon vainly endeavouring to stem the flow of the old man's speech of course i mean mrs Bedge. i call her emily because ha ah, i was in love with her she was a handsome girl in those years and a good one why look how she adopted that rascal i can't help thinking young maunders a rascal though he does want to marry ida which is not to be thought of yes yes emily always was good i don't believe a word of it not a word and mr dimsdale bringing his fist down on the table glared at his companion through his pince-nez you don't believe a word of what asked vernon soothingly i'm coming to that i'm coming to that don't worry me and hurry me mr dimsdale rubbed his nose in a vexed manner young maunders now eh what have you seen young maunders lately it's odd that you should ask that said vernon slowly because i have just parted from him at the athenian club don't have anything to do with him arthur he's a bad lot a very bad lot indeed oh it's nothing that he has done i wouldn't say to anyone else what i am saying to you but i can read character and i have observed master constantine he's so selfish that he would boil emily for his own gratification if it pleased him and she would let herself be boiled too she's as silly over the scamp as he is selfish towards her why do you cultivate his society eh what it's wrong and stupid yes yes stupid and wrong i haven't seen so very much of him since we left oxford objected arthur and certainly i don't cultivate him as you put it for i admire his character as little as you do and on more tangible grounds perhaps eh what tell me no i have not much to go on at school and at college and when we were children together in berkshire i never wholly liked constantine he's too selfish and too unscrupulous although he always keeps on the right side of the law still if he could do anything for his own benefit against the law without being found out and made to pay the penalty i believe he would have little hesitation in doing it i dare say no doubt you speak the exact truth from intuition he's a snake that young man a pretty curly insinuating snake he's poison in a well-shaped and well-coloured bottle poor emily poor emily silly woman but goodness itself she's a mrs lear with a thankless adopted child sharper than a serpent's tooth bless her and damn him for a rogue though bless me i can't bring any actual charge against the young beast ha no but when one sees smoke one guesses fire did you tell him that i was nemo asked vernon bluntly dimsdale grew furiously red and furiously angry so angry indeed that he rose to stamp about the room how the devil can you ask me such a question and how dare you if it comes to that am i an ass an idiot a babbler i wouldn't tell maunders that i had eaten my dinner much less inform him of a secret which it is to your advantage to keep why do you ask hang you for thinking me a traitor and a gossip forgive me said vernon with an apologetic air i am quite sure that you have preserved the secret of how i earn my money but i know that constantine haunts your house 
and thought you might have let drop a casual hint which he is clever enough as we both know to take advantage of but the fact is he found out about nemo and threatens unless i take him into partnership he has given me a month to turn over the proposition that he will make society too hot to hold me the young rascal the young blackmailing scoundrel cried dimsdale stamping again it's just what he would do he haunts my house to make love to ida and i would rather see her dead than as his wife especially now that i know what i am about to tell you what is it later on i shall explain meanwhile don't beat about the bush but tell me exactly what maunders threatens vernon detailed the conversation and dimsdale returned to his seat to hear the narrative when it was ended he nodded with compressed lips very clever on the part of master snake he has you in his power right enough since he is ready to betray you if you don't obey his commands well then i am going to a certain extent to put him in your power what have you found out i have found out nothing said dimsdale testily don't interrupt do you know of a blackmailer called the spider vernon half rose and then sat down again with an effort at self-control i have come across his work on several occasions and so has scotland yard no one knows what he is or where he lives or anything about him he gets his name from the fact that he always signs his blackmailing letters with the stamped representation of a spider go on said dimsdale quite calmly for him tell me more there is little to tell sir the spider learns people's secrets somehow and in a way which no one can discover he writes to this or that person and threatens unless a certain sum of money is paid to publish the secret by means of postcards sent to the private address and sometimes to the club of his victim of course there is no combating this mode of procedure so most people pay quietly although some have kicked why isn't the reptile arrested when he comes for his money tell me that sir tell me that sometimes the money is sent to a given address or at other times the spider masked and cloaked meets his victim personally he is not arrested because he always tells his victim that if the police are brought into the question and he is jailed the especial secret will be published all the same to the world by a hidden accomplice by means of postcards so you can see mr dimdale that if any person wishes his or her secret to be preserved they cannot risk an arrest still i have been employed by one or two victims to learn the truth and i have failed i can't lay hands on the spider nor can any of the official detectives mr dimsdale nodded he's a clever animal said he grimly you have described his mode of procedure extremely well my boy it's just the way in which he is tormenting emily mrs bedge is he blackmailing her of course he is don't i tell you so said dimsdale crossly she asked me to come and see her yesterday and showed me three letters with the figure of a spider at the foot of the writing the reptile wants five thousand pounds else he will send cards to her private address and to her friends stating that constantine is her illegitimate son what vernon leapt from his chair aghast of course it's an infernal lie said dimsdale warmly emily is a good woman even though she jilted me to marry a man old enough to be her father she was true to him i swear she was true to him and simply adopted the son of his partner maunders his real name was constantine mavrocardato because the boy's father and mother were dead there is no grounds for this assertion on the part of the spider absolutely none confound it sir you know emily raged dimsdale can you know her and doubt for a moment but that this viper has made a most iniquitous accusation she has the boy's certificate of birth and can prove the truth and moreover can call evidence on the part of friends who knew about the adoption when it took place but you know that mud sticks arthur however innocent a person may be emily simply can't stand up against this blackguard attempt if she refuses to send the five thousand pounds to the address given within a fortnight the spider says he will send cards making his lying assertion to all her friends even if she rebutted it as she can there would always be shrugged shoulders and raised eyebrows and cold looks and no smoke without fire remarks 
true vernon looked thoughtfully at his cigar tip plenty of innocent people do not care to face publicity on that account human nature is so prone to believe the worst even in the face of the very plainest evidence what does mrs bedge propose to do she wanted to send the money but i suggested that she should let me place the matter in your hands thank you i'll do my best but it's a difficult case as the spider is so hard to find on this occasion i don't think he will be said dimsdale with a grin since i propose to work with you i don't understand don't i speak plainly asked dimsdale tartly i said there were two cases didn't i answer me sir answer me yes but there is no but about the matter arthur i shall make a full explanation after i have asked a simple question and the question you see don't you how this information places maunders young beast in your power no i don't answered vernon very plainly and somewhat aggressively if you mean that i am to use my knowledge of his falsely being accused of illegitimacy as a threat to keep him from worrying me into a partnership i don't mean that in the least cried dimsdale warmly confound you sir would you make me out to be no better than this spider reptile what i mean is that you can say to maunders that you will receive him into partnership if he hunts down the spider and clears the character of his adopted mother not that emily's character requires clearing in my eyes mind you but we must consider the limitations of human nature my boy and place emily like caesar's wife above suspicion now do you understand eh what reply sir arthur nodded i understand and if maunders hunts down the spider he will be worth engaging as a partner no i don't mean that but you are setting him to achieve an impossibility unless he fulfils your wish he cannot hope to be a partner in the meantime you and i hunt down the spider then when we have him jailed maunders not having done what you asked of him can't expect to become a partner i think he will in any case said vernon grimly i think not sir said dimsdale very distinctly of course emily is all right and this blackmailing accusation is a lie all the same maunders who is anxious to secure a position in society and marry ida confound him he never shall with my consent will not wish the slightest breath of his being a possible natural child to get about i should say nothing said vernon stiffly quite so i never expected you would but the mere probability of the business becoming known will make maunders careful he won't worry you again as judging you by his own iniquitous self he will think you capable of betraying him now can you see yes but constantine knows that i would never speak i dare say because he thinks the bribe isn't enough he believes as peel did or walpole was it that every man has his price he won't worry you i tell you if you give the merest hint to him of the matter not that you need to for he will know about this blackmailing letter to-morrow vernon recalled how maunders had said that his aunt had detained him and how he had suggested that she had something on her mind he doesn't know it at present anyhow no emily saw me before speaking to him however listen to the scheme i have in my mind to catch this spider wretch he is trying to blackmail me oh vernon sat up and laughed how ridiculous you of all men cannot be blackmailed since your life is so open no man's life is open said dimsdale dryly and mine has its dark pages as every one else's has i have a secret not a particularly bad one it is true still one that i should prefer to keep to myself what is it i shan't tell you or any man snapped the ex-police commissioner it is sufficient to say that it is not a very bad secret and that even if it were told to the world it would matter little however the spider hang him i think he must have some acquaintance with my life in the east has learned something that i thought no one but myself knew anything about he asks one thousand pounds which is moderate compared to his demand on emily shows that he knows my secret isn't so very deadly or it would be worth more did he write to you asked vernon alertly of course he did making the usual threat of exposure by postcards to self and friends now i am going to consent to his demands and pay the money i didn't say that corrected dimsdale sharply 
but i am writing asking him to meet me in my library and receive the money also for him to hand over any documents to me which even hint at my secret when he comes you can be concealed in the room and we'll take him in charge but then your secret will become known objected vernon the spider always provides against arrest by leaving the evidence in the hands of others to publish he can publish what he likes about me said dimsdale coolly didn't i tell you that the secret is of little value the spider in his letter to me embroidered upon actual fact and can make things unpleasant but i can prove the exact truth of what he states and so can save my bacon there may be a few cold shoulders but i shan't care for that especially when my own conscience is clear now don't ask me to tell you on my secret for i shan't it has nothing to do with you or anyone else all you have to do is come to-morrow or the next day to my house at hampstead and i'll sketch out the plan of campaign what about mrs bedge she has a fortnight to consider the payment we shall catch the scoundrel before then you understand eh what good now i must be off to julia's ball are you coming not asked of course you love lucy and that will never do for julia who wants her to make a titled match good night ha <laughs> ha you have plenty to think about don't get brain fever good night then the oddly assorted pair parted for the time being end of chapter two read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter three of the spider by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter three how the trap was set as martin dimsdale had spent the greater part of his sixty years in burma he naturally retained an affectionate remembrance of that most fantastic country this he showed by calling his house rangoon and as a further concession to what might almost be termed his native land the house was built after the fashion more or less accurate of a bungalow on arriving some ten years previously in england mr dimsdale had purchased an ancient grange with its few remaining acres situated on the verge of hampstead heath in spite of the fact that the mansion was historic and famous this vandal pulled it down amidst the protests and to the grief of various antiquarians on the cleared ground he erected the rambling one-story building which reminded him of the far east it was not an entirely indian house nor a wholly burmese house nor an absolutely english house but a bastard mixture of all three as the chilly northern climate had to be taken into consideration but dimsdale looked upon it as a genuine reconstruction of the bungalows to which he had been accustomed and would hear no argument to the contrary this was just as well for those who differed from his views as he was a peppery little man voluble in speech from the wide road which flanked this corner of the heath the grounds were divided by a tall and thick-set laurel hedge which must have taken years to attain its present stately beauty at right angles to this red brick walls old and mellow ran back for a considerable distance to terminate in another hedge of mingled holly and oak saplings and sweet briar and hawthorn a gate in the centre of this gave admittance to a well-cultivated kitchen garden of two acres beyond and divided from the garden by a low stone wall stretched the meadows encircled by aggressive barbed wire fences the whole consisting of eight acres belonging to the man who had built the bungalow and was a very desirable freehold for a well-to-do middle-class gentleman in the first square between the hedges and brick walls stood the house looking quite dazzling in the sunshine by reason of its white tiled walls and the raw hue of its red tiled roof round three sides ran a deep veranda and the fourth side at the back bordered the cobblestone yard at the sides of which were the stables and outhouses everything here was neat and trim and sweet smelling as mr dimsdale would tolerate no litter and was fidgety about the drainage this was just as well seeing that the stables were over near the dwelling 
some judicious person had earlier pointed out to mr dimsdale that it would be advisable to erect them beyond the kitchen gardens and in the meadows but the little man out of sheer obstinacy refused to entertain the idea and built them cheek by jowl with the house on either side of the bungalow trellis work covered with creepers shut off the yard from the front garden this last consisting of smooth lawns bordered by brilliantly colored flower beds stretched to a rustic-looking white painted gate set in the laurel hedge to this a broad walk sanded to a deep yellow tint ran from the shallow steps leading up to the front veranda two noble elms the sole survivors of a once well wooded park sprang one on each side of the path from the trim lawns the building itself looked most unsuitable to the chilly english climate with its spotless walls and french windows these of which there were many opened directly on to the veranda which was paved warmly with red bricks rectangular and thin each window was provided with green shutters fastened back during the day and tightly closed every night at dusk on entering the front door mr dimsdale's visitors beheld a square wall and the first object which struck the eye was a large gong held shoulder-high by two fierce-looking burmese warriors carved in unpainted wood darkly blue eastern draperies glittering with tiny round looking-glasses veiled the left door which led into the library and the right door through which the dining-room was entered passing between curtains of similar texture and style hanging straightly from the ceiling the visitor came into a spacious room with a slippery polished floor and a high glass roof which lighted the apartment since occupying the centre of the bungalow there could be no side windows folding valves of carved sandalwood on either side gave entrance into two long narrow passages broken by many bedroom doors the bedrooms themselves looked on to the side verandas through french windows as has been described at the end of the middle apartment which like the athenian club antrium was the general meeting place of those in the house and served the purpose of a drawing-room was another large draped portal admitting mr dimsdale's male guests into a large billiard-room and a comfortable smoking-room also his lady guests into a boudoir and a music-room beyond these and shut off by another narrow passage at right angles to those at the sides were the kitchen the servants quarters and the domestic offices as the stables in the opinion of many people were too near the house the kitchen was too far distant from the dining-room but mr dimsdale who was fond of delicate fare prevented the cooling of the food in transit by having it brought to the table in hot water dishes he secretly acknowledged to himself that he was wrong as regards both stables and kitchen but would never admit any oversight to his friends as he had been his own architect he believed rangoon to be almost perfect in construction design beauty and in its blending of indian charm and english comfort and in the main he was not far wrong the house was filled with quaint eastern curios and draperies and contrivances and furniture although of this last there was comparatively little since mr dimsdale did not care to overcrowd his rooms as is the english fashion perhaps it was this sparseness which gave the house its foreign look the library was furnished with tables and couches and chairs and bookcases of black teak elaborately carved while the central apartment contained nothing but bamboo chairs and tiny bamboo tables all of which were covered with brightly hued draperies the dining-room was the most english-looking part of the house as it was decorated and furnished in the jacobian manner and looked massively british but the french windows three in the front three at the side uncurtained and pronouncedly bare admitted too great a glare into an apartment sacred to eating which for some traditional reason is always supposed to have rather a twilight atmosphere but mr dimsdale loved plenty of light and fresh air and all the sunshine he could get hence the many windows of the bungalow it would have been easier to have removed the walls dividing the rooms from the veranda and to have given them the full publicity of eastern shops and perhaps only the climate prevented mr dimsdale from going this length 
he was a fanatic in many ways and had the full courage of his cranky convictions as a police commissioner mr dimsdale had been secretly in partnership with a chinese merchant who traded from singapore to yokohama and from canton to thursday island that is he supplied the capital and quong lee managed the investments thus the astute englishman was enabled to return to england with an ample income and proposed to spend the rest of his earthly life in enjoying it the bungalow was his hobby and he never grew weary of improving its beauties or of showing them to admiring friends as he was a widower mrs dimsdale occupied a lonely grave in the shan states he had no one to coerce him into spending his money in any other way it is true that ida his only child was handsome and marriageable and light-hearted but having comparatively simple tastes she did not yearn over much for a fashionable life certainly she knew many in the great world and sought society to some extent during the season created by man but for the most part she preferred the home life of rangoon which was assuredly lively enough and not wanting in interest even to the insatiable appetite of the young for pleasure her father like many anglo-indians had been accustomed save when he had been stationed in lonely places to much society and was also gregarious by instinct he invited far east friends to sit at his hospitable board in the jacobian dining-room and made many new ones who were ready enough to welcome an amusing experienced old traveller for the sake of his society if not for his money dimsdale knew many people in the neighbourhood of hampstead and also a considerable number in the west end his sister lady corsoon and her husband sir julius were his sponsors as regards this last locality besides mr dimsdale belonged to several clubs took an interest in politics and the doings of the younger generation which had matured during his exile spent his money freely and was always an amusing chatty companion with such qualifications it was no wonder that he possessed a large circle of friends and was everywhere welcome it must be admitted however that some frivolous people thought he was rather a bore especially when he held forth about rangoon then there was miss hest francis hest who was so frequently staying in the bungalow and was so sisterly with ida that she might almost be regarded as another daughter of the jolly ex-police commissioner her brother francis hest of gerby hall bowderstyke yorkshire was a comparatively rich and superlatively far descended north country squire who was quite a rural king in his own parochial way but as his sister found the rustic life somewhat dull she had come to london after quarrelling with her brother who did not approve of her leaving home to force her to return he allowed her next to nothing to live on and not having a private income she had earlier been in great straits but being a clever girl of twenty-five and gifted with the dramatic instinct she had turned her talents to account very speedily a retired actor with the odd name of garrick gale who termed himself a professor had polished her elocutionary powers and she had obtained engagements to recite at various at homes during the three years she had been in london she had improved her chances so much that she made quite a good income she was seen everywhere and knew everyone and being a handsome well-dressed girl of good family no one could deny that she made the most of her opportunities of course francis hest resented her behaviour but always mindful that she was his sister he extended a grudging hospitality to her for six months of the year if she chose to accept it miss hest did but not in its entirety and simply ran down to gerby hall when she felt inclined she also had a flat in westminster but for the most part spent her days and nights at rangoon in the company of ida dimsdale the two girls who had met by chance at a fashionable at home two years previously had struck up a sincere friendship and saw as much of each other as possible some few days after the conversation between vernon and dimsdale in colonel towton's chambers the two girls were together on the veranda of the bungalow busily engaged in sending out invitations for a ball in honour of her birthday she was now twenty-three 
ida had prevailed upon her father to allow her to give a masquerade in the central apartment that was to be cleared for dancing not that it needed much clearing so sparsely was it furnished and all those expected were told to wear masks and dominoes at midnight all the guests were to unmask and supper was to take place ida limited her guests to the number of one hundred and with the assistance of miss hest she was weeding out undesirable people with a bamboo table between them and a screen to keep off the hot sunshine it was now the end of june and extremely sultry the young ladies were too intent on their agreeable work to notice that a stranger was advancing up the yellow sanded path and yet as the newcomer was arthur vernon he could scarcely be called a stranger seeing that he was a friend of the house and a weekly visitor on this special occasion he had called to resume with mr dimsdale the conversation about the spider and in his anxiety to complete the business which included the setting of a trap for the blackmailer would have passed by the girls in order to interview his old friend but frances who seemed to have eyes at the back of her head as vernon had noticed on several occasions drew ida's attention to him at once here is mr vernon dear she said pushing back her chair and straightening her tall imperial form let us ask him to suggest some one good day miss hest good day ida said vernon advancing easily and looking very smart in his bond street kit some one for what ida shook hands in her friendly sisterly way and explained in a week we are giving a masked ball in honour of my birthday and just now francis and i are making out the invitations only a hundred people arthur as the house won't hold any more comfortably here is the list ninety-five names as you see so we thought that you might suggest a few other people finished miss hest leaning gracefully on the back of her chair we want gentlemen more than ladies isn't a week's notice rather a short one to give for an entertainment of this sort asked vernon running his eyes over the submitted list why should it be demanded ida opening her eyes there is no fancy dress to get ready and i don't expect that every one will be engaged on that particular night it's mid-season you know ida miss hest nodded her approval i told ida that every one may be engaged well i can't change the date of my birthday dear and i didn't think of a masked ball until yesterday if we send out invitations for one hundred and fifty guests that number will be sufficient every one can't have other engagements on that especial night i don't know so much about that said frances in her deep voice which is of the contralto species people work desperately hard during the season vernon laughed and handed back the list who was it said that life would be endurable if it were not for its festivals he remarked smiling i never see the weary faces of pleasure-seekers during the season but what i think of that saying well never mind ida tapped her white teeth with the pencils she was using and cast her eyes over the list of guests can you suggest four gentlemen arthur there are two who would certainly come and whose names you have unaccountably omitted miss hess raised her strongly marked eyebrows why unaccountably i'm thinking of colonel towton and mr maunders there said frances turning gravely to her friend i told you every one would notice that you had left them out am i supposed to be every one asked vernon smiling again but why have you left maunders and towton out may i ask i thought they were such friends ida sat down and coloured through her fair skin i wish to ask connie maunders but my father won't hear of it why i don't know vernon reflected that he knew very well since dimsdale objected to maunders paying undue attentions to his daughter but he kept this knowledge to himself and inquired about colonel towton your father and he are such great friends of course ida said petulantly and as they've both been in the east and are both of an age they should be friends there's a difference between forty-five and sixty-odd dear said frances mildly and between twenty-three and forty-five retorted miss dimsdale whose cheeks were growing even more scarlet and colonel towton is such a nuisance he's always don't laugh arthur i beg your pardon but i guessed what you were about to say said vernon with mock gravity 
but why do you object to colonel towton who does not look more than thirty who is a distinguished soldier and to say nothing of his being well off and handsome i don't know that he is so very well off retorted ida defending herself he has only that old place in yorkshire i know nodded francis wisely it's a grange at bowderstyke three miles from my brother's place colonel towton is of a very old family and i know for a fact that he has at least one thousand a year you might do worse ida i don't wish to marry money said ida in vexed tones and i don't love colonel towton who is old enough to be my father he is worth a dozen of maunders put in vernon pointedly ida stamped you take the privilege of our friendship to be rude and presuming she said angrily my private affairs have nothing to do with you ida ida reproved miss hest don't i will said the young lady crossly and i shan't ask colonel towton to the ball when father won't let me ask connie you call him that asked arthur with a shrug ida looked at him indignantly evidently with a conscience ill at ease i shall never speak to you again she said in an offended tone not if i get your father to let maunders come to the ball oh can you can you she asked in a girlish delighted tone on this occasion i wish you would father likes you so much and you can tell him she added handsomely that if he will let me ask connie i shall invite colonel towton there that's fair you are playing with fire warned francis gravely better not invite mr maunders you can never marry him it's indelicate to speak of my marriage in the presence of a stranger said ida with some heat i am not a stranger i hope remarked vernon quickly yes you are when you are horrid with a rosy face of sheer annoyance she flitted to the end of the veranda ida was rather like titania being sylph-like golden-haired and blue-eyed whereas miss hest resembled judith with her strongly marked handsome face and black eyebrows who is horrid asked the voice at this juncture and mr dimsdale appeared on the threshold of the french window which was behind the table ah oh, arthur is that you i have been expecting to see you come into the library vernon obeyed at once as francis had hurried after the petulant girl to pacify her miss hest treated ida as a wilful child and by scolding and coaxing and cajoling managed to get her to behave like a reasonable being it must be confessed that dimsdale had spoiled his golden-haired darling and even the boarding-school she had attended could not supply the place of the mother who was dead the old man turned to vernon when they entered the drawing-room through the french window who is horrid he asked again vernon laughed and slipped into a chair it's a storm in a teacup he explained easily and accepting a cigar miss hess advised ida to give up maunders and i supported her then ida i know i know broke in dimsdale sadly she is wilful and is quite infatuated with the scamp arthur arthur i should have married again so that ida could be trained by a good woman i can't manage her i think miss hest can said vernon significantly and she has sense enough for two a most masculine young person but do you think you are wise forbidding maunders to come to this masked ball yes i do ida is crazy about him opposition will only make her more crazy warned vernon shaking his sleek head it would be better to let them come together and then she would get sick of him maunders is so shallow that she would find him out sooner or later for ida has plenty of common sense if it was not obscured by this persistent frivolity which after all is only a youthful fault but if maunders wants to marry her he doesn't mr dimsdale i can vouch for that he wants to marry your niece what dimsdale who was lighting a cigar wheeled around with an astonished air why i thought you loved lucy so i do replied vernon earnestly and she loves me but maunders is a fascinating fellow and a dangerous unscrupulous rival i quite believe it eh what the fellow's a scoundrel grunted mr dimsdale crossly he should be tarred and feathered still if things are as you say i don't mind ida asking him to the ball 
but she must ask Towton also, he added with sudden determination. She will do so, although she dreads his love-making. However, she may grow sick of Maunders when she finds he is running after Lucy Corsoon, and Towton may catch her heart in the recoil. Hope so, hope so, muttered Dimsdale, turning his cigar on his lips. I want to see my little girl safely married to Towton, who is as good a fellow as ever breathed. But not a young fellow. However, it is wiser to let events take their course for the present, Mr. Dimsdale. Opposition, as I say, will only make Ida more willful, since she is filled with romance natural at her age. Ugh! breathed the old man, wiping his brow with a bandana handkerchief. What a handful women are! But there, he dismissed the subject with a wave of his hand. Let us leave these trivialities and talk business. Have you heard anything more about the spider? Well, I made inquiries at Scotland Yard, and find that he is very much wanted by the police. Mr. Dimsdale grunted. Huh! The police are always wanting and never getting. The spider is too clever for them, protested Vernon anxiously. He won't be too clever for me, said the elder man with sudden ferocity and slapping his hand on the table. Eh, what? Am I to be blackmailed by an infernal scoundrel who swears that he will tell a parcel of lies if I don't pay him one thousand pounds? Hang him! If it is merely lies, why pay? asked Vernon dryly. There is a grain of truth in the lies, admitted Dimsdale crossly. The absolute truth I can face, but the lies make me out to be a very queer person indeed. I shall tell you all when we secure this man. Vernon looked up, astonished. How do you propose to secure him? If you arrest him, his accomplice will spread the lies you talk of, by postcard amongst your acquaintances, as is usually the case in the spider's business. I'll risk that, sir, I'll risk that, said Dimsdale with a defiant air. But I'm hanged if he'll get a penny out of me. I shall set the trap, and you will be in this room behind a screen to rush out and seize him when I give the signal understand eh what understand come come speak up what sort of trap do you propose to lay asked arthur cautiously well dimsdale leaned back twisting his half-smoked cigar between his fingers it was the mask ball this silly form of entertainment which ida insists upon having for her birthday which gave me the idea you see with the chance of being masked and mingling amongst my guests the spider will be the more ready to come and will suspect nothing i am writing to him to-morrow telling him about this ball and am suggesting that he should come wearing a mask to enjoy it then at eleven o'clock say he can secretly meet me in this room to receive the money cash echoed vernon significantly of course the fellow's too clever to risk checks they would put the police on his track would put the police on his track my boy but do you intend to pay the money no 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 how stupid you are arthur use your brains use your brains boy i shall offer to pay the money and then you concealed behind the screen that japanese one up in the corner can rush out and but i have no authority to arrest him interrupted vernon impatiently why not post a policeman or a plain-clothes detective to catch the beast i don't want any policeman in my house retorted dimsdale gruffly and you are detective enough for me if he blackmails me you will be the witness and we will have every right to hold him then you can take him away and hand him over to the hampstead police he may show fight then have a revolver with you snapped the old man i don't want a scandal and a row on ida's birthday and in my house it seems to me that you are going the best way to have one said vernon deliberately much better let me inform the police and have the thing done in an orderly fashion no i tell you dimsdale again slapped the table i'll do it my own way or not at all if i catch the beast by laying this trap both myself and mrs bedge and many other people will be safe but if we call in the police however secretly the spider, who seems to have ears and eyes all over him, will get wind of the ambush. Vernon nodded. There's something in that, he assented. Perhaps on those grounds it will be better that we should engineer the job together. Well, he stood up straight and slim, 
i shall come here on the night of the ball by the way when does it take place monday week it's a short notice but ida only thought yesterday of this way to celebrate her birthday are you quite sure asked vernon taking up his tall hat that it is advisable to lay this trap on the night of the ball yes i do yes i do said dimsdale in a fussy manner the mere idea of masks which will enable the scoundrel to hide his infernal face without comment will recommend itself to him he will think that he is exceptionally safe not dreaming that i intend to fight you will fight then am i not laying a trap into which he will walk inquired dimsdale with much exasperation of course i fight as my secret is not such a very bad one i can defend myself and i am willing to risk that being known which i had rather were kept secret for the sake of saving other people from being blackmailed by the beast eh what am i not right yes i think you are but i wish you would tell me your secret after we have captured this scamp i shall do so and then i shall tell you the absolute truth together with his embroideries don't look so grave boy i haven't committed a murder or stolen from the till i never thought of such a thing said vernon hastily but dimsdale good-humouredly pushed him towards the window i know your doubts my boy but later i can satisfy them meanwhile let us settle that i am a scoundrel and look on this trap as one set by a thief to catch a thief by the way does maunders know of the threat made by the spider against his mother she intended to tell him you know i am not aware sir maunders has not been near me since that night at the athenian club the same night when i met you at towton's rooms well i shall come to the ball meantime let me know i'll advise you if i hear from the spider there get out good-bye unless you'll have a cup of tea or a glass of wine vernon declined and departed the girls were no longer on the veranda or even in the garden end of chapter three read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california